Okay. Thank you, worship team. Can we clap for them? Uh, if you didn't know, that song is called Divine Romance, uh, as Juno said. So that act, we actually almost made that our wedding song. Uh, so that holds, uh, gets me a little teary-eyed, actually. So as Juno mentioned, uh, he said PG, but actually this morning may be more PG-13. Uh, so this is the last call if you have young children here and you think it would be more appropriate uh, for them to go off to the power zone with the children's ministry. Please, please, this is your last opportunity to do so. Um, otherwise, you may have some fun, awkward, and interesting questions uh, on the ride home today. So, hey, maybe you need to have those. I don't know. I think it's a good thing that we talk about sex. Uh, but, hey, maybe that's, uh, you don't feel like in the mood to do that this morning. So, if you're new with us, my name is Mark Lohman, and I'm the associate pastor here at New Life. And, obviously, you know what we're talking about this morning Sex, as I already said. And uh, before we go into that, um, I actually want to be really careful and sensitive. Um, sex is probably, along with money, the biggest thing that we talk about, whether we're conscious of that or not, in our culture. I mean, this is an incredibly sophisticated subject. And so I'm not going to be able to talk about every single aspect of it. Um, so perhaps you may be in a situation here uh, that I don't explicitly mention and so I just want to acknowledge that and also to let you know the next couple weeks we will be talking about marriage and singleness and if you're a widow, everything, but just not this morning. So just know that ahead of time. Also, statistically, uh, we would know that in this very room there are various things going on, one of which could be uh, maybe you're, you're newly married here. And you thought sex was going to solve every single issue in your marriage. And perhaps you're disappointed that it hasn't. Perhaps you're addicted to pornography. All right? Perhaps you struggle with same-sex attraction. Uh, perhaps one of your spouses is far more fulfilled sexually than the others. Perhaps you've been sexually abused or raped. So I say all of that not to put a damper on this conversation, but to simply say... Sex is, is this crazy thing where for some people it offers an enormous amount of shame, regret, and disappointment, while for others it's the most awesome thing in the world, right? So th there's a very fine balance here that we're, we're dealing with. Another thing is maybe you're single in here and uh, you have the urge to have sex, but then the church tells you um, to not. What do we do with that, right? How do we work that out? And so it breaks my heart that the church doesn't talk about sex. I think if you ask our culture, what does the church think about sex, you're going to hear one word, no. Thou shall not. And it comes in as no surprise then that I think our culture finds our sexual ethic in the church to be entirely repressive, archaic, outdated, and absolutely not even relevant. And so I just want to say this conversation matters because we don't talk about it, and we should. What we do in the church is we simply just judge those on the outside with their sexual behavior, perhaps even inside the church, but then we don't even want to talk about it inside the church. That's why I love Paul in 1 Corinthians. Because Paul says, and like if you've been here the whole series the last month, he's like, no, actually, let's talk about some messy issues. Let's be candid. Let's talk about this. It's going to be uncomfortable, but it matters. The church should be the safest place to have this conversation of sex. Right? So if someone, someone should be able to come into new life and say, you know what? My wife and I are really struggling with our marriage, and it's because we're not fulfilled sexually. Can you help us? Hey, I'm addicted to pornography. Can you help me? Hey, I'm single. And I have all these urges to have sex. Help me. And so the degree that new life becomes more and more like Jesus is the degree that we are willing to share our brokenness and come out of hiding. So, Paul, I dig the scriptures. They're so relevant, and they speak directly into this human experience of sexuality. So Paul, he writes this letter to the church at Corinth called 1 Corinthians. 
And the, our passage this morning, Paul, what he does is that he talks about the different views of sex in that culture 2,000 years ago. And here's the fascinating thing. They're almost exactly the same views of sex today. Like down to the T. And so it's actually a pretty tricky passage. So we're going to have to come maybe focus a little bit more. Hang with me as, as we walk through it. But know this ahead of time. Paul is talking about two different groups. And they have the polar opposite view of sex. And so what he does is that he quotes slogans of theirs that they use to justify their sexual behavior. And these are super well known. Everyone says them. And he quotes their slogan, then he says, okay, now let's talk about that quote, and let me respond to it. So that's kind of what's going on here uh, in Paul's argument that we're going to look at. So let's address the, the first group. This is a, a growing movement in the church, the church in Corinth, uh, and then we'll get to the second group in about 50 minutes. <clears throat> we're talking about sex this morning, people. You can laugh. Okay, it's Okay. I know it's church. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. See what happens when you talk about sex. I almost just said chapter 6. Okay, chapter 6, verse 12. Uh, let's get this going. So Paul starts right away, like I said, with a quote, a common slogan that this first group is saying about sex. Here's what they say. I have the right to do anything, you say, and then here's Paul. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything. Paul says, yeah, but I will not be mastered by anything. Here's their second quote. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. Okay, let's stop there. Perhaps you're wondering, what in the world do those two quotes have anything to do with sex? Those are bizarre quotes. What's going on here? Okay, the first quote, Paul says it twice. And they say, I have the right to do anything. Here's what they're saying by this. Um, you know what? Jesus has forgiven everything I've done. It's all grace, right? Jesus has set us free. It's all about freedom. And it's kind of like what we do in America right now. We love freedom, democracy. So I can do anything I want. You can't tell me what to do. This is my body, and I'll operate it the way that I want. I have the freedom to do anything. Paul says, eh, time out. <laughs> he says, that, that may be true, but not everything that you can do is actually good for you. I have the freedom be careful, because your freedom may actually end up enslaving you. Second quote, Paul says next, food for the stomach, stomach for food, God will destroy them both. What's going on here? Very bizarre. This is a slogan, and what it means is this. Hey, we are just physical creatures, and, well, what happens when my stomach growls, when I get hungry, when I have the urge to eat, I eat. Food for the stomach, stomach for food. Same thing when you get tired. When, when, my, when my body is biologically shutting down and I have the urge to sleep, and I get tired, I sleep. And so they're saying, hey, it's the same thing here. When I have the desire for sex, well, I can just have sex. We are just biological creatures with physical urges that we can respond to. And, and kind of related to that, what they're saying in the second half of that quote that God is going to destroy our bodies, is that, hey, you know what? Uh, our physical bodies, like, God doesn't really care about them. They're, they're kind of like second order things because God just really cares about the spiritual things. That's what matters. And after all, aren't they just going to disintegrate into the ground? 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years from now? So YOLO, you only live once. Have sex. Do what you want. Respond to the biological urges in your body. Food for the stomach. Stomach for food. God's going to destroy them both. This is the first group in Corinth. Now, hopefully it doesn't take too much for you to realize that this is almost exactly our secular culture's understanding of sex. It's casual sex, not a big deal, we're just biological creatures. We're purely physical. 
And if you have the desire and the urge to have sex with someone, go ahead and do it. Right? Just respond to your biological urges. It's fine. Man, you die at 80, 90, 100 years old. Live it up. Make the most of what you have now. Here's the problem with that. See, actually, this understanding of sex is actually a pretty low view of sex. The Bible, and this may be shocking for people, actually offers the highest, most powerful, most good and beautiful understanding of sex possible. So what, what, what does Paul say to this? Well, let's follow along with this argument. Check this out. End of verse 13. So he's given them, he's quoted their two quotes, and here's what Paul says back to them. The end of verse 13. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. What Paul is saying is this, essentially, to strip it down. Your body matters, and what you do with your body matters because you're getting your body back when it's all said and done. What God did to Jesus in raising his body from the dead, right? He got his physical body back. The nails that were in his hands were the same hands that were resurrected. He's saying, uh, your body's actually not going to be destroyed. You guys are saying that you're wrong. Because we believe in the resurrection. You're getting your body back. And so his point is this. What you do with your body now matters. It's actually not going to be destroyed when it's all said and done. God has created our body good. Genesis 1, God created the earth, everything in it, and declared it to be good. Matter, physicalness is good. Christianity says, oh, we're here just to save souls. Yeah, that's true, but God is doing way more than just saving souls. He's putting our bodies back together. So your body's not something just to be thrown out and kind of do whatever with. And even deeper... Not only has God created your body good, but he's created it in such a way for it to be enjoyed by someone else. And it's deeply powerful and mysterious and quite enjoyable in the right context. And it gives us a spiritual picture of our intimacy and our love with God. So he continues, and this is what Paul gets into, verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Main point here, don't take something that's good and holy and beautiful, your body, and throw it off to a bunch of unholy trash dump things. Here, here's his main point, point. this is what we're going to camp out on. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Okay, a lot of confusing language here. What's the main point? Paul's saying that sex is a lot more than just Sex. Sex is about two people becoming one. And he quotes second chapter of the Bible, Genesis 2. And he quotes this. He says, the two will become one flesh. See, this whole idea of becoming one, of, of being united, of becoming one flesh, it means to, to be deeply infused together. Almost to the sense where each individual loses their individualness. And so something powerful happens in sex, of which it's just a physical representation. Two separate, autonomous human beings are actually molded together and fused into one, not just physically, although that is true, but also emotionally. Psychologically, every other Ali 
chiefly spiritually. As one author puts it, sex is the melding of two bodies and two souls. It's physical and spiritual because we just can't separate the two. It's when you know and are known. When you make love to someone, you know them at their deepest levels. And that's why there's no such thing as casual sex. Because it involves all of you. And to God, the only relationship that, that is strong enough to hold that, like, that fierce, untamed power is marriage. Right? The, the only container strong enough to hold like, the nuclear force that we call sex is marriage. That's why a local pastor says this. You know, the problem with pornography isn't that it's sexual. The problem with pornography is that it's not sexual enough. Pornography just reduces sex down to body parts, and you can view them on a screen. See, biblically speaking, sex is way bigger than that. It's two beings uniting with everything they have. And that represents our relationship with God spiritually coming together with everything that we have. And so Paul says, hey, you just can't take that and like flippantly share it with everyone. He's like, that doesn't even make sense. You wouldn't do that. He says, it's, it's almost like it's too explosive. <laughs> right? It's, it's going to mess you up and it's going to mess the other person up when you don't use it in the right context. And I think most people instinctively know this, right? May disagree with it and that's fine. But I think we instinctively know this. I think there's probably a difference felt for a couple that has a one-night stand and they wake up the next morning versus a couple who's been married 40, 50 years and they wake up after making love. There's probably a, like a different feeling there, I think. I mean, there, there was a mom in our congregation that told me the other week, she said that she can always tell when a girl has slept with a guy uh, by judging how they react to the breakup. Breakups are way more messier when you've slept with someone. So I, I think we kind of instinctively know this. Again, may not agree with it, but I think we know this. And he, here's where it gets fun. Uh, neuroscience, you're like, where did that word come from? The last 10 years, we are able to look at the human brain in a way that we've never been able to. It's, it's fascinating stuff. There's a whole book, it's called Hooked. It was written eight years ago. And it talks about merely like, the scientific look at the human brain during sex. It's crazy stuff. Here's what they say. They say that, that there are three chemicals in the human brain that are activated, if you will, during a sexual experience. Here they are, three of them. Hang with me. First is dopamine. The second is oxytocin. And the third is vasopressin. Crazy words. Here's what they mean. Dopamine. You've probably heard of this word before. Dopamine is that sense when you get super excited, uh, maybe it's a sports game, you just won the championship, I don't know, maybe you're eating an In-N-Out burger, who knows, right? But you're full of excitement. Dopamine, that's released in your brain. Same thing happens during sex. Second thing, oxytocin. Okay, oxytocin is just for females. This is the female bonding chemical. This causes a girl to desire the same kind of contact again and again with the guy that she's sleeping with, producing an even stronger bond. Now, this bond is it, it's real. Like, I'm not making this up. And oxytocin, think of it this way, it's kind of like the adhesive on glue. It is really hard to pull it off. That's why breakups are highly emotional for girls. Other than you have to know about oxytocin, it's involuntary, meaning this. For a girl, her brain releases oxytocin whether it's a one-night stand or she's 70 years old and having sex. Same thing's released. 
She can't help it. Here's the third one. Vasopressin. Gentlemen, this is for you. This is the male bonding chemical. Now, why do you guys kind of feel like so, or at least they should, uh, loyal and they want to be the protector in the family? They want to protect their kids and be their guardian. They're loyal to them. Vasopressin. Same thing released in the male mind during sex. Here's why I bring this up. These three chemicals are supposed to work together, not just dopamine. We live in a dopamine-saturated culture for sex. The problem is our bodies don't. They include two other chemicals. So here's what this book says. The long quote, I think it's worthwhile, it's in, uh, incredibly insightful. Here, here's what these, uh, they have their MD, this is what these doctors say. When a couple is involved in even a short-term relationship and breaks up and then each moves on to a new sexual partner, they are breaking the oxytocin and vasopressin bonds that have formed. This severing of the bond explains the painful emotion people often feel when they break up. When the breaking of relationship occurs, it is felt in the same brain centers that feel physical pain and can actually be seen on brain scans. Like any other powerful experience, an intense romantic relationship molds the mind. It's fascinating to me. And so there is evidence that when this sex bonding breakup cycle is repeated, a few or many times, even when the bonding was short-lived, damage is done to the important built-in ability to develop significant and meaningful connection to other human beings. These sexual relationships affect their brains, molding them not only to damage their attachment ability, but to become desensitized to the risk of short-term sexual relationships, eventually believing that this behavior is harmless and acceptable and not involve the psychological and mental health part of themselves. Here's the last sentence. This gets me. The inability to bond after multiple sex encounters is almost like tape that lost its stickiness after being applied and removed multiple times. So, is it unfair for God to say through Paul, I have the right to do anything. Eh, not the best thing for you. I have the right to do anything. Be careful. Don't become enslaved to it. Is that unfair of God to say that, knowing this? I don't think so. When an electrician comes in your house and he says, hey, don't mess with those live open wires. Is he being unfair? No. Sex is incredibly powerful. And it is so good and so powerful and so beautiful that God says, like, make sure you, you use it in the context that I made it for. Otherwise, you're actually, it's going to explode and you're, it's not going to go well. Like, it's so powerful. <laughs> make sure you use it the way that it was made to be used. And that's for your benefit. So Paul says, after this, and he says this with like, he's almost like yelling when he says this. Verse 18. Flee. Run. Like, go the opposite way from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And in case you're wondering... The phrase sexual immorality there, in Greek, the word porneia, which is where we get the word pornography from. It's like a, like a catch-all term, and it includes everything that is any type of activity of sex outside of marriage between a male and female. So friends with benefits, uh, going to a strip club, looking at pornography, hooking up, uh, whatever you want to throw in there. Oral sex outside of, of marriage. Yes, I just said that. Sexual immorality. 
And he says, run, like get away from that. Don't mess around with it. Because it's all a weak, low view of sex. It's like it's not, it's not the real stuff. It's a spoof on what sex is supposed to be. You're going to sell yourself short and your partner when you engage in these things. Now, uh, I'm not blind to the fact that I would imagine a lot of people here probably are full of regret, shame. Uh, Maybe you feel a little guilty right now. And I just want to say the church is the safest place. It should be. You don't need to hide. Last time I checked, God loves everyone, even the most broken, jacked up people. That's kind of what our series is about. The gospel is radically inclusive, but it's radically transformative. The writer says this, you know, the good news is this, sex is powerful, but God is even more so. Don't underestimate the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to put your life, your sexual life, back together. Paul, he ends this chapter with these words. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. In Corinth, 2,000 years ago, old city, right? Nothing new is under the sun. Sex trafficking was a big deal back then, just like today in L.A. and Orange County, if you didn't know. And the slave market would be in the very middle of the city. And, you, and that's where women were sold and bought as property. Crazy. That still happens today. But you could go there. You could go to that slave market in the middle of Corinth, and you could buy a slave, set her free, and make her your wife. Paul is saying, this is a picture that our God is a God who goes to the slave market and he buys the person who's experienced sex the way that it hasn't meant to be experienced and he will make you his bride. Is that you today? Are you needing to be set free? Because you don't have to wait any longer. Now, um, well, it hasn't been 50 minutes, but on the very, the second camp, the second group going in Corinth had the polar opposite view of sex. In some ways it's the same though. Now what do they say about sex? Paul quotes them. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now, for matters you wrote about, and here's their, here's their slogan, right? It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Don't have sex. Other groups that had lots of it, and who cares, do it with whoever. For them, this group is saying sex is evil, dirty, nasty, sinful. Don't do it. If you're a really spiritual person, you don't have sex because you spend all your time praying and reading, you know, words of hope, daily bread, Jesus calling. You listen to the fish on the car on the way. That's what you do. You don't have sex. That's just for, you know, really evil people do that. Sex is bad. That's what they said. I'm not making this up. Paul's response? But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, 
but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This was written at a time in which a wife, a female, was the legal possession of her husband. And Paul says, this is a revolutionary claim in that culture, the husband does not have authority over his own body, the wife does. May not seem like a big deal, today's culture, no one ever said that back then. This expresses the husband's obligation to satisf satisfy his wife sexually. Paul's saying, actually, no, I'm giving you a very positive view of sex, and you should satisfy each other sexually in marriage. <laughs> Within the culture of this group, what happened is that the only reason why a man would marry a wife is so that they could procreate and have kids, so they could pass on their name and their property and their legacy. If sexual desire was sought, if it was sought outside of the marriage with someone else. And Paul is saying mutual, satisfying sexual relations are healthy and necessary in a marriage. Now, of course, there are times when a couple can't have sex, perhaps for physical reasons, um, who knows what. I won't get into all that. But by and large, Paul's point is, have sex in marriage. <laughs> Why? Because it is good and powerful and beautiful. Sex is God-created and God-given. Another pastor says this, we were sexual before we were sinful. Genesis, 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Guess what the first commandment is in the Bible? Uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Have sex. And if I'm doing my math right, um, if you're going to fill the earth, it means you're having more sex than two, three, four times. We were sexual before we were sinful. The Bible doesn't start with no, thou shalt not. No, the Bible starts with thou shalt. <laughs> And if you don't know, for goodness sakes, there's an entire book in the Bible, Songs of Solomon. I'm not making this up. Seriously, read it. Do your devotions with your spouse tonight with this. Uh, it is Jewish erotic love poetry. We don't talk about that. <laughs> like, it talks about the human physical body. <laughs> what a young couple making love. The Bible, if, you, if you're a prudish, straight-laced person, um, the Bible actually will make you very uncomfortable reading it. So, the question for us, if you're a married couple, and like I said, we'll talk about singles and widows and other things in the next couple weeks. The question if you're a married couple is this. Does your marriage have a thriving and flourishing Love life. Now, some of you guys are probably like, wow, I've been waiting for this message. <clears throat> Be careful. Because this means, this means that you need to pursue romance in your marriage. And it's so easy to have kids and grandchildren, crazy work schedules, and we wonder why our marriages aren't thriving then. Husbands, do you want a good sex life? Then date your wife. Invest in your wife. Help around with dinner, chores, Kids, going, drop them off school, whatever it is. I don't know. I don't know your schedule. Help your wife out. Pursue her. Date her. Wives, 
Let your husbands know that you desire him. Let him know that you're thankful for him. Spend time with him with the things that he likes to do. And when he pursues you, like acknowledge that. Maybe initiate physical sexual activity with him. So I have no idea where you're at this morning. But we're going to invite the music team back up. And they're going to lead us in a time of response. Now, I think it's super easy for us to forget that actually God is after our joy. Right? It's so easy to believe that the best sex is offered in short, dopamine-saturated relationships with a beautiful person on a screen, whether it's a computer or a TV, in your mind, who knows what, maybe in person. And I think it comes down to trust. Do you trust that the way of Jesus is the best thing for you in this? Do you trust that his blueprint for a male and a female in marriage offers the best, most beautiful, and powerful sex? And so there's so many ways to respond this morning. There's going to be a prayer team in the back. Sensitive issues for people. I, I'm very aware of that. So maybe you need some prayer. We have candles over here. Signifying the light and the hope of Jesus in an extremely, perhaps, dark area. You can take communion. Reminding you that you've been bought at a price and Jesus has set you free. Maybe it just means you sit here, you sing along, raise your hands. That's fine. And lastly, the ushers are going to come forward at this point. You know, like sex, money, huge thing in our culture. And so one of our values here at New Life is that we don't want money to control us. And so we give it away for God to work here. And so if that's you, the ushers will come forward and you can drop your money in the baskets. And so let me pray for us. God, no doubt sensitive subject. For some, an immense amount of pain and hurt, regret. For others, best thing in the world. And I just pray that you have your way. Your will would be done. Lives changed, lives transformed. Sin forgiven, joy experienced. Make us beautiful. Amen.